All right. Happy Friday, everybody. Thanks again for joining for another uh, Community Sync for PWA Studio. Uh, we have a pretty full agenda today on demos and uh, Community Corner topics, so uh, definitely let's get started. I think the first up in the shoot, uh, we have Ravon, uh, who is here and wants to demo a recent spike that has turned into some production code that's a pretty cool feature for us. So, uh, Ravant, if you want to start us off, and then we'll move to Mr. Kalkaban next. Sure. Uh, let me share the screen. Oh, one second. Can you guys hear me, by the way? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Everybody in the office can. <laughs> now I know how you sound, Stephen. What? In blue jeans, I mean. I talk to you every day, Ravon. Yeah. Not in blue jeans, though. Sound much taller in blue jeans. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so this spike uh, was about how to differentiate between CE and E code, uh, because uh, when it comes to certain aspects, there might be something in Enterprise Edition which probably wouldn't be available in CE, or something that might uh, uh, that might look different in community edition uh, compared with the uh, enterprise edition. Previously, we were using uh, Boolean variables. Uh, you would simply do is e, e and then uh, if 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 it is true, then you return a different code. If not, you return return something else. But the problem with that is uh, first, you will actually be having some dead code in your bundle, which is going to increase the bundle size even though it has no, no use to it. And also when it comes to GraphQL, for instance, certain, uh, yeah, I guess it was, it's the GQL tag, it was doing some kind of a static analysis. So even if you're returning two different uh, fragments, but since they have the same name, it keeps complaining about it. So we, uh, we found a way to uh, uh, get away from that. For instance, if you look at the gift card summary, <laughs> In this case, in price summary uh, file, we are simply getting it from the gift card summary file, but then we actually don't have that file in the first place. Like if, if you look at my um, the Explorer, we don't have a gift card summary. All we have is gift card summary .ce.js and a ee.js file. If you actually look at them, C you wouldn't return anything, and in E you actually return something like a React component. So if you, uh, if you look at the env file, what's that? Yeah, this is where you would mention uh, what edition you are running. In case of CE, you would give CE. If not, you would give EE. If you don't give anything by mistake, if you forget something, defaults to CE. So from here, uh, a webpack would realize that this path is it has to resolve to CE in case of CE, if not to E, and then it resolves that file to the to the respective component, and that component is inserted into this file, where it, wherever it is being used. The same can be used for uh, queries as well. Like if you have a, a different query for a community edition and a different query for enterprise edition. Because these are JS files at the end of the day, you can actually namespace them like this. And if tomorrow we come up with a new uh, edition, maybe a gold edition or something, just as an example, you could simply add another file here. And the way we are using this uh, is um, this. In the measure ah, resolve, that's where we have added this. In case of is e, you would just put this guy. If not, you would put this guy. So what happens right now is you're telling Webpack when someone doesn't give you an extension, first try for the file name dot wasn. If not, file name dot mjs. If not, this guy or this guy depending on the environment, and then keep dialing down. If at all it doesn't find any of these guys, it just uh, throws an error saying I couldn't find a file uh, for this particular path. 
they actually telling webpack at this point um if you look at this example uh, this uh, the client config that's where you're de uh, defining this ease e from the project config you're looking for uh, this variable the one i mentioned in the env file if it's not present it will be defaulted to ce in which case this is not a uh, enterprise edition with this the assumption being uh, with one particular uh, bundle you can only serve either ce or ee like you can't have two uh, like the same bundle serving both the clients as an example <laughs> that's the only uh, uh, downside of this thing any questions anyone I have a question. Um, you showed us uh, the Magento resolver, but uh, there is no resolving for GraphQL. It's only for JavaScript, if I'm not totally wrong. So for GraphQL, if you look mm -hmm. at the example, I'm actually returning it as a JS file itself. It's, it's a normal ah, okay. So even ah, though okay. GraphQL, it's actually a JS file. If we wanted, we could have simply named this uh, .ce .graphql, like like we have here, because it's it's part of a thing. It's just mm -hmm. that as of now, we are still treating graph queries uh, like GraphQL queries as uh, JS uh, exports. That's the reason why you see uh, ee .js on the top, even though you are actually returning a GraphQL query. And what about CSS? CSS, uh, since this was a spike, and we never actually had a reason to have different CSS for CE and E at this point, we didn't come up with that. But in the future, if we want, all we have to do is just uh, is E, uh, you would just give dot EE dot CSS or SCSS or whatever is your CSS extension, you would simply give it here and just uh, you would go through with it. This is like, this is like you're telling graph, uh, you're telling uh, Webpack how to how to resolve something. The same actually goes with just config as well, because when just is doing it, it, it has to know uh, how to resolve something, because just doesn't go through Webpack. So even in just, you have a variable that you could give. Uh, in module file extensions, you would simply say this. The only difference being in Webpack, you have to give dot ee dot js. In just, you would give just ee dot js, for instance. Any other questions? Um, um, can it be used for extending existing components or? adding uh, whole extensions or module, modules uh, based on, for example, the E version? Okay, uh, so that totally depends on how you're actually using it. Uh, for instance, let's see, where are we using these guys? Oh, no. So this is the place where we are using the gift card summary, for instance. But at this point, it can either go to ce.js or ee.js. It can't go to both of them. But if you have some part of your code that's common for both, and then some part of your code that's different for both, uh, you would define another file, I would presume, uh, having the common code, which will be used uh, somewhere like here, for instance. Oops. Import. Uh, Component from maybe uh, some file or JS, something that you have. And then you would use that component along with your custom component, uh, custom uh, styling or custom component here. The same actually goes for what do I do? I missed that something, but never mind. Uh, the same you would do here. You would do the same. You would actually use the same component 
in both C and E, and then on top of it, you would give your own uh, wiring, like if you want to have different style to both of them. At this point, that's the only way to do it. Uh, we might come up with a different way. Uh, presumably, like probably here, use JS also as part of, uh, like we, we have to tell Webpack not to let's just stop here. If you find like a e.js, use that along with it. Also use a JS file, something like that. Uh, it's just that at this point, Webpack doesn't allow us to have multiple uh, resolutions uh, uh, together. For that, we, we might have to write our own plugin. Uh, let me try to show you. <laughs> Just give me one second. Can you actually see my screen right now? Yes. Uh, like, uh, see the uh, Chrome uh, Chrome browser that I'm using? No. 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 Hold on. Now? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let's look at this thing, for instance. Yeah, so first we actually had uh, a plugin like this, like we were using the normal module replacement plugin. Can you see, uh, is it visible right now? The font. So we were using normal for module replacement, and inside which we were uh, like looking for EE file and C file manually. If let's say we want to have like custom code as part of uh, different files, but also common code as part of a, a generic file, we could use a plugin like this. This is like instead of using the extensions, uh, pack, we are actually uh, building our own plugin on top of it. So here, instead of using an else if, we can simply do in the if. Uh, if you find the EE file, also try to find the common file and combine those two when you're returning uh, to Webpack. We could totally do something like that, but I, uh, the only reason we didn't go with it is at this point, we don't have a reason to, uh, to do it. Like all the use cases we had were like completely different, like for enterprise edition and for uh, community edition. We never actually came up with a case where uh, both might have some common code. Okay, one, one more question. So now, now these two files are in the same directory. So is it yes. possible to use files from different directories or completely different trees, for example? Uh, I don't think so at this point. No, you can't. But if you build uh, your own uh, plugin, like using the Webpack normal module replacement, uh, you can definitely do if you already have an idea of where EE, uh, EE files are stored and where CE files are stored. If you know the, the uh, at least from the root directory to the enterprise edition directory and the root directory to the community edition directory. If you know that path? Yes, you can. You would simply, like here if you see in the line 177, you are defining the CE file path as the context, which is where Webpack is running right now. Along with it, you are trying to find the file name.ce.js. If you already know the path where you are storing these these all enterprise uh, like community edition files, you'd simply use path.join and just change the path. So yeah, you can still do it, but that might have to be through a plugin, not through a uh, like webpack variables directly. Thank you. Anything else, guys? I don't think so. It's a good pattern that'll unblock us coming forward. Awesome. Great. Well, that's it from it from my side.
Yep. And so Thanks, obviously uh, a lot of questions here or in, in, in conversation. So if you have questions for Ravant or questions about the PR, it's 2121, right? So uh, you can go in and comment. There's some additional questions that have been posted and there's some good conversation. Um, so taking a step back, <clears throat> we obviously uh, released PWA Studio 5.0 uh, this past Tuesday. Uh, pretty big major release, a lot of great content in there. So uh, we have uh, Mr. Kalkaban here along with Bruce to, to kind of walk us through the new release notes, talk about some of the new docs topics that were created, uh, and, uh, and talk through some of the, the kind of the contents of that release. Uh, so Timothy, all, all you. Cool. Thanks. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Right, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, so as Andrew mentioned, we have uh, we had a new release this week, and I've tried to capture all the changes and features that are included in that release, and you can find them under this release uh, link from the repository. Um, this is where you actually where you can actually find all the different past releases, but uh, the top one is 5.0, and uh, I provide a very high level overview of what's in the release and provided uh, links to relevant new docs, uh, specifically um, scaffolding. Uh, there's documentation on the create PWA command that was introduced in this release. And um, there's also a new topic on talents that came in pretty early in this release. Um, uh, if you've worked with develop, you're probably already familiar with talents, but just in case, uh, people are wondering what talons are. Um, this topic goes over how, what they are and how they relate to um, hooks. Uh, the other one, the other change that has a new topic associated with it is the state management. We, we've kind of abstracted the way state management and um, use um, created hooks that you can use to uh, work with the Redux um, backend um, to do that. And this topic goes over um, what state management is and uh, how it's done in PWA Studio and provide some code examples. Um, what else? I, I know I presented this release notes earlier, so I'm not gonna go over the same, um, you know, it's got, descriptions here in the, all the the release, uh, the PRs that were associated with this release, which is a lot, it's about 200, I think, as well as, you know, upgrade instructions and um, known issues with this release. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Bruce to talk about uh, his page builder their documentation for this release. All right. So my name is Bruce Denham. For those who don't know me, I'm from the Page Builder team. Um, let me share my screen. All right. All right. So the Page Builder integration starts out with this new menu topic here. Um, I set this there, and so the first page here is really. Uh, all about the concept, the overview, um, gives you a high level, big picture starting out with. Uh, starts getting a little more detailed here about what it is and uh, how custom types fit into all this. Um, then it gets into the details about the uh, parts of the integration framework. Um, you can read about it there. And then we go into kind of how it works um, and the, the, the flow of how it works, how basically the Master format HTML of uh, page builder content gets converted to uh, the React components for output on PW Studio apps. So that goes through that. So the really, you know, to get a, a real good feel of what this all is, this is a great page to start with. It's the first page of the integration docs. Um, so there's some there's some good stuff in there. Um, then we get into the known limitations. You know what it can't do, uh, what it doesn't support, like widgets within the tiny MCE editor, um, dynamic blocks not supported in PWA Studio yet, um, you know, other things here, uh, staging and preview, uh, cache and validation doesn't work or not supported yet, uh, CMS pages only, which means that you can't yet 
uh, with page builder content, you know, you can play, create blocks and dynamic blocks and, uh, you know, uh, catalog entries for the descriptions, product attributes and stuff like that. But only the page builder uh, page content actually works right now. So those are the, the known limitations. Um, here we get into, this is, you know, if you use page builder uh, content with the native controls and content types, this works automatically. There's nothing that the developer has to go in and, and create, you know, their own React components or any of that. But if you do, if, you know, a lot of developers create their own uh, content types in page builder, this is basically how to, you know, overview of how to create the comparable React components, um, create your aggregators to, to take the properties out of the master format HTML and page builder uh, to hydrate those components. So this is a tutorial that goes through, you know, all that you need to do um, for setting up a component, uh, starting out with some uh, skeleton files, um, and explaining what those, you know, skeleton files do. Uh, we go through, basically they're adding two things, three things if you use style sheets. You're adding an aggregator, a property aggregator. It's called config aggregator. Um, you're uh, adding your own style sheets that might you know, might need to mimic the uh, styles from the page builder content. And then you're adding components, um, the actual React components, and how to populate those. We got a one debugging tip at the moment. Um, we have utility functions, which are used in the aggregator to uh, help you extract the properties from the HTML and, and hydrate the, uh, the uh, React components. And then we have the source code uh, comments, which describe the properties for each component and their, their types. And that is it for all of the page building integration stuff. And again, it's accessed in the new integration tab up top. Is there anything? Oh, uh, along with this, probably next week, I'll actually have on the example site, I'll have uh, uh, in the first part of this, this overview. Uh, we go through the converting um, a page builder content type called a quote that we also use in the page builder docs. And uh, I'll have the example code for that quote uh, on the page builder side and then the few uh, the aggregators and the components and the uh, config changes on the PWA Studio side so that people can go through this tutorial, tutorial and, you know, follow it. They can install the, those examples and kind of see how it works. Too. Um, there's also three videos that really talk about the big picture um, from an overview, how it works, uh, the parts, um, describing all that. Those will also be up. I'm working with uh, uh, Mike and I can't remember, uh, Kayla maybe, to get uh, YouTube, uh, we have a Magento YouTube channel right now. So we're working to get those, you know, get that process started again so I can post those videos up there. And then we can actually embed them in docs or, or in various other places. So in the works. Any questions on any of that? Cool. That's great. Looks like that. <coughs> Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, James. Uh, sure. Okay, so uh, next up we have another great demo. Uh, I think we have Andy on the line who uh, has been working on gift cards uh, and is ready to demo that. Yep, I'm here. <clears throat> oh, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? All right, what's up, y'all? Uh, let me share my screen here. I'm solo dadding today at home, so if you hear some screams in the background, uh, I might have to run. Perfectly normal. <laughs> uh, okay, so I did gift cards. So we're here. We're on the um, new cart page, which I think we demoed the framework of before. Before some of these components were in here, so um, we'll see some of the other contents of this page uh, from my esteemed colleagues. But uh, I'm here to show off gift cards. So. We have this like price adjustments accordion uh, that we're calling it. So uh, if you open up the gift card here section, oh, I've uh, added about uh, $700 worth of stuff in the cart just to just so you can see the prices going up and down. But uh, pretty straightforward. Come in here and enter a gift card number. Uh, you can apply it. 
Uh, you see it kind of shows up here in a list of uh, gift cards. You can apply multiple gift cards. Um, I've actually only got one test code right now, so I can't show you multiple, but they would show up in a list here. It's pretty simple. Uh, and then the price uh, over here in the summary automatically updates. Uh, this was a $500 gift card. Um, and then you can remove it, uh, and, it and it goes back to what it was before. Um, the other part about gift cards that's kind of cool is in addition to just applying and removing them uh, from the cart, you can check the balance of one of these guys. So it's pretty straightforward, just kind of that information shows up uh, right underneath the text input and shows you how much is left on the card. Um, that's, really about, that's really about it for gift cards. <laughs> Short and sweet today. Uh, I guess I could go into some of the technical details. A uh, uh, couple mutations here for applying and removing the gift card. Um, GraphQL exposed um, some pretty uh, uh, direct, or like the, that's what the mutation explicitly does. Pretty simple, straightforward. Um, so that was fun. And then a couple queries for getting the cart details and then uh, getting the balance itself is actually a, a quick little query too. So uh, a lot going on, but pretty straightforward for the end user. Um, and that's gift cards. Oh, sweet. Awesome. Any questions for Andy? Uh, yeah, what happens if you apply the same uh, gift card twice? Like, if it does an error? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to share this back again. So, yeah, there actually is an error that happens. Uh, oh, by the way, this is a PR in progress. So, if you see some wonkiness, like this check balance stuff hanging around, this shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We'll fix that. But, um, yeah, you can't actually apply the same one. It'll, I, I'm not taking the actual uh, message. This is just like a hard-coded, like invalid card message. So, um, yeah, there's improvements to be there. But to answer the question, yeah, I can't apply the same card. I don't know if that's a setting on the back end or not. Honestly, maybe some merchants would let you do that or not. But I think it actually is a setting. But this looks fine. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I'm just taking the response from the back end. So I'm assuming that they're taking the settings into account. Uh, yep, okay, cool, yep, that's it. Uh, there's a question here in chat from Keith about, uh, for UX specifically, uh, asking, shouldn't a gift card number be partially obscured? Um, so, Scott, I don't know if you want to weigh in that. In on that, I think something maybe we haven't considered, but we could take back to the drawing board, right? Interesting, maybe. Uh... Maybe. Yeah, so great, great question, Keith. We don't, I don't think, have an answer for you right now on it. Uh, we'll, we'll go back and do a, do an assessment there on the UX side. Uh, Sorry, what was the question? I missed that. Uh, the question was, shouldn't the gift card number be partially obscured? Like you would obscure a credit card number. Okay. So, good, good feedback for UX. We can go back and take a look. Uh, Definitely want to make sure we still have time at the end of the call for our community corner content. So we have a couple more demos here that we want to push through uh, before we get to that content. I think we have Steven up next who has coupons. Coupons. Um, this won't be much, any different than what you just saw really with Andy's, Andy's demo. And um, also I couldn't get my instance working properly. So Good thing is I took a little GIF capture um, back when I did this work. So, cart cube. Oh, well, nobody can see anything. There you go. All right. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I couldn't get this uh, running just now. I'm having some computer issues, but uh, the GIF works. So as you can see, coupons. It's pretty much exactly like what gift cards. Uh, what you saw with gift cards, uh, except that you can only enter one and um, yeah, you see, when, once you apply, uh, the you, the uh, t the price summary total is updated with the the applied uh, coupon um, discount that the GraphQL tells us is now applied. Um, uh, there's an error state there, which you can't see in the GIF, where if you like enter an invalid one, it says invalid coupon. But yeah, this is just a, a GIF on repeat, really, just over and over. 
Love okay. Yeah, that's, that's why there's two. I was like, how do you get this two? <laughs> how do you get it? You just <laughs> the cursors, the two cursors. Is uh, no, my my point yeah. I don't know. I restarted my computer, and for some reason, my browser thought it was offline, but it wasn't. I had network. But wow. Navigator online was false for some reason. Somehow, I have no idea. Uh, the next thing I did, I wanted to show off real quick, was breadcrumbs. But since my globe's not really working, I can't show that either. Um, but uh, the breadcrumbs were, I guess I could just talk about them real quick. So it was a really small change uh, in 234, category URL path is now returned, uh, which lets us do intermediate breadcrumbs. So before, the intermediate categories were not linkable. So that, that might not make sense, but like when you go into a product and then you see up at top, it would say like home, um, tops, sweaters, and then the name of the product. But sweaters, the breadcrumb wasn't actually clickable. It was underlined, it looked like it was clickable, but if you clicked on it, nothing happened. Um, so now, just by adding this to the, the uh, GraphQL response, um, it, it works. The, um, the path is now uh, linkable. And uh, so yeah. And then the last thing I wanted to show was uh, we have a we have a utility called validate queries that um, that that was implemented a while back uh, before we had done the split from Venia UI and Venia concept. Um, and so when we did that, we split up components between the two uh, directories. This utility stopped working. Uh, now that we're doing a lot more work with GraphQL lately, especially with the cart, um, I kind of wanted to get it running again to see make sure that we were you know, linting our GraphQL queries, make sure we were just writing everything um, correctly. So this is a sample output. I ran it against um, something a while back. But you can see now, um, if you run the command, and, and we don't, we're not running this on push. There was a little debate about that internally, whether we wanted to make, you know, make this a, um, a prerequisite for pushing. But I think we're going to hook it up to our CI. So if you guys are... Um, Writing GraphQL and you and you have a pull request, um, you might see a, an error that's like your GraphQL is invalid. So just um, if you're writing GraphQL, I would I would say try to run this run this to uh, this utility. It's just yarn run validate queries. You don't need that. It's just yarn run validate queries, and um, it'll tell you if stuff is if you're if you're using fields that are deprecated, which is just a warning since they're not actually removed. It'll tell you if you have some other invalid things. Um, you know if there's something that's completely not. An, an invalid schema, it'll 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 error out for you. So, yeah, it's cool that this is running now and it's been merged to develop. So, any questions? Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, and so, our last demo today, we have Tommy who's going to go through his shipping methods PR uh, very quickly. Uh, yes, very very quickly. Uh, do you need to reshare that? Oh, yeah. Sorry. All right. So, lightning round. Um, I did shipping methods, yet another uh, new item here in this accordion. Um, this was um, uh, mostly done, but then we got some UX feedback. <laughs> uh, we got some UX feedback uh, that we wanted to go ahead and apply. So, um, I already have an item in my cart. Uh, the shipping flow is kind of, it's going to be gated by making sure that this is collapsed. We don't want to show any, um, uh, kind of urge people to do this unless it's something they are interested in. Um, so once you get through that gate, uh, you'll see kind of fields you would normally need um, to estimate shipping. Uh, a little different from Luma in that we only collect the fields that we actually need, so it's a lot less, um, uh, a lot less to the user if they just want to like estimate before they proceed to check out. Um, this is all, uh, we, we just brought over some like simple logic um, where like some countries don't have states. I think we might need to adjust these labels to stay, say like state province or state region. I don't think we've decided on that. Also zip uh, is pretty local to the United States, so zip postal code. Uh, we'll probably get a label change. Uh, but this is all dependent and driven from data uh, from Magento. So when you switch to the United States, you get a new list. If I go to France, um, I should get a new list there. Um, and then from there, it's pretty straightforward. You enter your data. 
they get shipping methods. I need to do some loading state because uh, this is actually hitting some um, uh, public carrier APIs. So we're hitting USPS, FedEx. That's going to take a little bit of time. So we want to make sure that the loading indicators uh, correctly tell the user that uh, we are do expect kind of some network latency here. Um, and then very straightforward, once you select a method, it's also hitting the API, so it does take like a second or two, but you'll see once the once you have successfully like set that method on your part, uh, you'll see that it updates. If you select anything else, um, it'll update the totals as soon as that's done. Um, and then kind of all the additional stuff uh, related to like, um, California zip code, uh, all the additional stuff related to like um, selecting other shipping methods uh, in another state. So if there's like additional tax, all of that is just kind of automatically done uh, with this new kind of like GraphQL cat automatic cache update work that we've done that like each of these mutations just trigger that, that query to refire and then React kind of works out what it needs to re-render. So um, it's been a lot easier kind of interacting with these other components, just merely like updating that cache and then they automatically re-render. It's um, been really cool. Um, but this should be landing here in the next couple days. I have just some loading state stuff to do. Uh, I think we're going to do like once you dirty the form, we're going to hide these shipping methods and just show the button, um, fix up some labels and things like that. But um, if there's any feedback or any questions, please let us know. Um, for this lens. Hold on. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Tommy. Um, so that's it for our demos. Uh, here in the last few minutes, uh, uh, we talked about last week, we have a new portion of the call called Community Corner, insert rainbow Community Corner graphic. Uh, uh, so Jordan, uh, this last five minutes of the call is all yours uh, to walk us through anything that's uh, kind of top of mind for community. Sure, give me a second. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Can you also hear me? Or? Yeah, yes. yes. Because you responded. <laughs> um, so uh, Lars opened a uh, proposal for, I guess, respecting the store configuration. Um, and I just noted, noticed that uh, Ravant has already commented on it. So I'm not sure if this is still a, uh, a valid question from Lars, or is it? Uh, still open. So maybe Lars, you can um, let us know if you have enough information. Uh, from from my point of view, uh, hi. <laughs> from my point of view, it's, uh, there are already some comments, but what I like to see there is, uh, hey, we we need this feature from from the PVA Studio core team and uh, speak about a concrete implementation or something like that. And yeah, this is this is from my point of view. Okay, so we still need to elaborate on this a bit more, I guess. Yeah. We... Okay. So there's big caveats here. The line as well. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, we've talked about like config, like polling stuff from the Magento config and there's kind of like a chicken or the egg thing where like we generate our bundle based on some of these config values. So like doing stuff, even with the service worker could mean that your bundle is way larger than it needs to be. Um, I mean, we could limit the types of config things to make sure that it's not something that dependently renders certain components. Um, but I think this is still something that, yeah, we do need to like discuss internally, figure out like the best suggestion, whether or not it's, we, this is like an intermediate solution, but we do suggest like regenerating your bundles based on config value changes. But uh, that definitely, uh, I mean, has some like development caveats. You don't want to like redeploy your front end every time there's just a config change. But um, uh, having read through this, I think there's enough information for us to like kind of make a decision and put in something for the intermediate so these so you can do more config-based um, uh, rendering. Yeah, we can add that to the board, you know, and uh, attract that discussion ourselves. 
Yeah, I think this is definitely yeah. definitely something the team's been been discussing internally. So, Lars, thanks for the PR, and I think it gives us some more great information, some great detail here. So, uh, not something that we have properly groomed, but something that we should pull into grooming and come up, like as Tommy indicated, with either a temporary kind of solution or you know, a intermediate solution. Um, and so we'll we'll kind of uh, formulate a, a a better response there, a better kind of idea on what the solution will be, and and update the. Uh, update the issue here and uh, obviously update the, the community on the call, on an upcoming call. Yeah, I agree. We should groom it and get an, and get an answer out there. Yeah. yeah, it could be continued, I guess. Or did you want to say anything, Lars? Uh, cool, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, so another thing you guys have probably all seen is we opened the uh, we made the SEO snap uh, publicly available. Um, so please check it out, um, install it, and uh, let us know what you think. Any feedback is more than welcome. Uh, and we'd love to see uh, pull requests. So is there anybody that has like uh, questions about SEO snap that's on the line? I have not and, seen it yet. Right, then we should check it out. Um, another <coughs> issue or more, more of a question. Um, somebody asked about uh, uh, multi-language. Um, I know this has been a topic a few times in, in Slack, um, so maybe someone from the team can elaborate a bit more on where we're standing for internationalization. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. So internationalization, localization, right, is definitely a roadmap item for us uh, coming up in the next couple of quarters. Uh, of course, we've heard from the, the community, you know, are there ways that we can accelerate the, the delivery of, uh, of those features? Uh, and, and we are open to that. And so there are, there are existing conversations, I think, with members of the community uh, who are looking to contribute here uh, on, on a solution for uh, uh, multi-locale. Um, so something that's definitely coming up, something that's planned. If, you're want, if you want to contribute in that area, definitely reach out to us and let us know. Um, but uh, as of today, it's, it's just uh, an upcoming item that's following uh, some of the Venya feature work that we're doing right now. So uh, I'd say stay tuned, and if you want to contribute there, let us know. And, and we're absolutely open to, to PRs that help us accelerate the deli delivery there. So, um, yeah, I mean, on internationalization itself, right, is, you know, going to be one of those things that goes through a, you know, kind of an architecture phase, right? Um, yep. Right, it's a solved problem that's been solved by a lot of different, you know, CMSs and, and uh, websites including Magento. So um, that's going to be one of those things where we'll evaluate a lot of the approaches out there, including Magento's, and see how it fits with the React and, uh, and PWA, you know, like core principles that we're looking at. So that's, that's going to be the trick is which, which one fits into our ideal, you know, solution of loading things on the fly and having uh, like with, with what Ravon uh, looked at earlier, the, the CE versus EE question, same kind of principle applies there. All right, awesome, thank you. Um, so I guess that's it for the uh, community corner. So I guess for the uh, like and subscribe part, I give it back to Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, yep, so I think that's it. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, don't forget to smash like and subscribe. Honk if you like it. Thumbs up. up onwards and upwards. <laughs> What's like? up with the honk if you like it, man? That's a, that that's a so new weird. Thing. It's a, the the internal team name is in, is Untitled Geese. So. Uh, oh. <laughs> it's just honk. Oh like lord. Honk. Honk. Wait, wait, are you saying honk or hump? Honk. 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 Yeah, I thought you guys were saying hump. Oh yeah, that's hump. Cool. No. no, we're not saying that. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great Friday. Have a great uh, rest of your weekend, and uh, we'll catch you guys next week. Yep. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.